So good evening and welcome to another exciting and informative virtual star party hosted by Science Heads. Tonight we'll be learning how to observe our night sky with just a pair of binoculars. My name is Ruth Carisu and with me is Richard Stember who will be presenting tonight. Richard has a Bachelor of Science degree in Chemistry from the State University of New York and he owns and operates his own company that develops software for scientists. He's also a very avid amateur astronomer, and he um, started Science Heads to share his love of science and astronomy with the public, and he serves as its ex executive director. Science Heads is a nonprofit organization whose mission is to promote and support STEM education and science literacy. Additionally, Science Heads is a member of the NASA Museum Alliance. I also have a Bachelor of Science in Chemistry from Ursinus College in Pennsylvania. And in my professional career, I was an analytical chemist, a nuclear quality engineer, and an entrepreneur. So we welcome your questions. You can type them into the question box or the chat box. I'll be monitoring both and asking them as we go. We'll try to answer as many as we can. And if we don't get to them all, we will post the answers on our website. And again, if you would like a copy of the handout, it's in PDF format. You can download it from the handout screen. So now that the housekeeping is over, Richard, let's get the star party started. Yeah. You know, I enjoy going out and looking at the night sky uh, but I don't have a telescope. I wish I did, but I do have a pair of binoculars. So how can I use them effectively? Well, binoculars are a great tool for astronomy. Uh, in fact, there are many times that binoculars are better than using a telescope. Uh, for example, there's no setup time. You can quickly point them anywhere you want in the sky, and they're far more portable than a telescope, which makes them real handy on a camping trip or just for a quickie look at the night sky. You know. This picture that I'm sharing you with, with you right now of the Milky Way, um, I wish I had that kind of view outside my front door, but you know, here in Orange County, we've got a lot of light pollution uh, to deal with. Um, but uh, imagine being able to peruse uh, the Milky Way with a pair of binoculars, it's just astounding. Um, fortunately, every once in a while, a couple of times a year, I make it up to the mountains, up to Big Bear or Arrowhead, and, and on a clear night, you get a beautiful view of the Milky Way, just like uh, we see um, here. But there are a few other things that I recommend having besides a pair of binoculars, Ruth. And let me share them with you also. Um, I suggest having a planisphere like, like is pictured here. Now at the last star party, um, I showed you how to use a planisphere. It's really easy to use. You simply dial in the uh, time and, and uh, day. Um, for your location. And uh, the planisphere shows you what constellations are up in the sky in the various directions. And that's a great tool to combine with a pair of binoculars because uh, knowing where your constellations are will help you find the objects. Besides a planisphere, I would highly recommend getting a little red flashlight. These are really inexpensive on, on uh, uh, Amazon or eBay, you can pick up a red flashlight for just a couple of dollars and a planisphere costs about $10. Um, I recommend having some planetarium software and we'll talk about this a little bit more in a couple of slides. It helps you plan out what you're gonna see, what you're gonna look for that night. Having a lawn chair is really handy or even better yet, one of those uh, beach chairs. I find that very comfortable when using a pair of binoculars and Besides the binoculars, I often use a tripod or a monopod. Those of uh, you who are uh, into photography, you probably have a perfectly good tripod or monopod already that'll work with um, a good pair of binoculars, as long as you also have a tripod adapter. And um, we'll talk about uh, the different types of tripod adapters as well. Well, what are the differences between using a telescope and using binoculars? Well, of course, with a telescope, you only use one eye, um, but our brains are wired to interpolate a lot of information from both of our eyes. So actually, by using a pair of binoculars, you can see more detail uh, than with a telescope of the same size or aperture. Also, telescopes typically invert images, but, by, but binoculars do not. And that makes it a lot easier to navigate the night sky um, but there are plenty of advantages of using a telescope over binoculars. Telescope, 
telescopes often come with a tripod or a solid mount of some kind, making them much more stable. They often have tracking motors and even go to computers built into the tripod, which makes uh, finding objects a matter of just pressing a few keys. But, you know, binoculars are a lot less expensive. Uh, $50 will buy you a, a decent pair of binoculars uh, on Amazon. Um, for a telescope, I would suggest spending anything less than uh, $200 or $300. So what are the best kind of binoculars to use? Most uh, amateur astronomers will tell you um, a pair of 10 by 50s, like I have in my hands here, are the best binoculars um, for, uh, uh, for use at night. Um, 10 by 50 refers to the magnification and the aperture of the uh, binocular. 10 is the magnification and 50 is the width or aperture of the, uh, of the front lens, 50 millimeters. And it turns out by that 10 by 50s are pretty lightweight. They're easy to manage. Your arms won't get so tired. You can get bigger binoculars, but it gets real hard to hold them in place for any period of time. Um, 50 millimeters is a pretty good size. It gathers a fair amount of light. And it turns out that a magnification of 10 is just about right for most of the larger celestial objects uh, that we look at. Um, so other key points, if you're going to go out shopping for a pair of binoculars, uh, you want to get one that um, has an adjustment, an interocular adjustment that's, that's appropriate for your eyes. You know, just about every pair of binoculars has this adjustment where you can move the lenses closer or further apart. And this, uh, this adjusts for the distance between your two eyes. Everybody's eyes are at a different distance. Um, so not all binoculars actually, you know, fit everybody's face. Another important uh, factor is uh, you'll want to get binoculars which are fully coated. Um, the really cheap binoculars don't have any coating on their lenses, and that's typically fine if you're just using it for terrestrial use, you know, looking for birds or looking, uh, you know, uh, out in the ocean or on a beach. Um, but when you're looking at night time, you'll discover with those kind of binoculars that uh, they produce a lot of false color. It turns out that different wavelengths, different colors of light, focus at different points um, in an uncoated lens. Uh, when a manufacturer coats their lens, it adjusts for that uh, difference in, in focus and, um, and makes the, what you're looking at much clearer to see. For example, uh, if you were looking at Jupiter, which tends to be a very bright object, you may see a lot of false color around it, a lot of red uh, around the planet, uh, but a fully coated pair of binoculars reduces that. Lastly, um, I recommend getting a pair of binoculars that have uh, an attachment point for a tripod. This one has um, a place to screw in an adapter for a tripod. Uh, they're often hidden with a little cap uh, that I'm I'm pointing at on this uh, image right here. You unscrew that, and then you got a place where you could screw in um, an adapter for your for a tripod. Um, I've got an uh, inexpensive adapter in my hands here. I just bought this on Amazon for about nine dollars. Um, very easy to attach. You simply screw it to that point in the front of the binoculars, and then the bottom here uh, has a foot for a standard photo tripod. You can get fancier adapters, like the one pictured on the right there. Um, that's that's a, a favorite of mine. It also has a mounting place for a green laser. So you can uh, show people where you're actually pointing the binoculars at. Having a tripod can be really very handy uh, for a pair of binoculars. Um, on the left here is pictured a tripod that I got years ago with, with a video camera. Um, what I really like about this tripod is that it has a long um, extension, vertical extension, that uh, you crank up here. And uh, that's very handy when using binoculars because um, you're going to be crunching down to look through the, uh, through the lenses at the front there. And um, I'm pretty old. Crunching down like this isn't too exciting for me or too comfortable for me. After a while, my back starts hurting. So when you're using a tripod, 
expect to have to do some crunching like this unless you're seated. But even better yet, and many of you photographers may have one of these as well, you uh, can also use a monopod uh, with, a, with a binocular. Um, monopods are uh, basically tripods with a single leg, which, then, which makes them a lot easier to set up. I much prefer a monopod. Um, because I can tilt it any direction that I want. And I can use it while standing. Um, I can use it while sitting down as well. And there's that uh, beach chair that I was talking about. That may be the most useful accessory when you're uh, using a, a pair of binoculars at night. Well, my binoculars are imprinted on the side with some numbers, like feet at a thousand yards. So what does that mean? Good question, Ruth. So um, that's referring to what we call the field of view. It's basically how much of the sky your binoculars are going to show you. Um, and that's very useful when you're uh, looking at objects. Uh, if it's a very, very small object, you're not going to expect it to appear very large in your binoculars, particularly 10 by 50s. They're only magnifying 10 times. Um, to calculate the field of view, um, you simply divide that first number. If it's in feet, you divide it by 52.4, and that gives you the field of view in degrees, and that's what star charts are typically marked in. Um, so that makes it very handy uh, when using your binoculars, not only to view the sky, but also to find objects in the sky. If your binoculars are, are marked in meters, then you'll divide, it, divide that first number by 16. But again, this helps you find objects. If we look at the uh, right hand most image there on this slide, um, we can see um, I marked the width of the field of view or the field of view for my 10 by 50s with a red circle. They, uh, it works out to be seven degrees. Um, and um, this star chart is showing where the Pleiades are. We'll talk about the seven sisters of Pleiades in a few minutes. So that red circle is seven degrees. Um, and to find the Pleiades, I'll often look for the star Aldebaran in the constellation Taurus. And note that according to my planetarium software, that's about 14 degrees below the Pleiades. So in other words, it's two fields of view um, below the Pleiades. So it, it makes it really easy to find an object if you know your field of view. But if you've forgotten what the field of view is for your pair of binoculars, I've got another secret to share with you. And that's the old finger and hand trick. Uh, it turns out that our fingers and our fists, when held out at arm's length, become a great measuring tool for the night sky. So if you're out below the, the stars and you know that the Pleiades is about seven degrees above Aldebaran, that's that reddish star in Taurus, you can use your fingers or your fists to kind of find where the Pleiades is. Believe me, it's even easier than that. But a pinky is about one degree. At arm's length, that is one degree of the night sky. For those of you scouts out there, Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts, make the scout symbol, and at arm's length, that's five degrees. For those of you who are politically uh, minded and want to show power, make a fist and hold it out to the end of your arm, and that's 10 degrees. And if you make a bunny, bunny ears with your two end fingers like that, that's 15 degrees. And for you surfer dudes out there, hang 10, that's uh, 25 degrees. That also happens to be about the width of the Big Dipper. That's a great way of measuring the sky. And to give you an idea how small objects can be in the sky you know we often think when we see a full moon it's huge turns out a full moon is only about half a degree so uh, our eyes and our minds are playing a little trick on us but uh, if you were to hold your finger your pinky out there you would easily block the whole moon with your with your pinky believe it or not it's one more suggestion for you ruth before you go outside plan ahead and I suggest uh, getting some good planetarium software. 
Um, there's plenty of free software out there that you can download for your cell phone, both iPhones and Android phones. Um, there's also a free software you can download for your PC. One of my favorites is the KSTARS program. Uh, it offers a lot of capability for zero cost. Um, and uh, the images that we captured today for our slides are were all created uh, using uh, KSTARS. I'm gonna give you some links at the, at the end of the uh, slides here today. Uh, so you can investigate each of these uh, planetarium software vendors and, and choose which one you'd like to use as well. So when you go outside, be prepared, know what you're looking for. And uh, here's some final tips for you. Turn off all the lights. You know, we've got enough light pollution in Southern California. Uh, you don't wanna add to it with your porch light. And in fact, if you have some lights turned on inside your home that are flooding out through a window, turn those off as well. You want to get as dark as you can outside and let your eyes adapt for 10 or 15 minutes. Um, you'll be amazed what you can see once you've let your eyes adapt to the darkness. Use a planisphere and a red flashlight only. Don't use a regular flashlight because that will ruin your night vision. But a red flashlight uh, keeps your dark adaptation. And here's a good hint. I mentioned in the beginning, if you want to find objects for binocular viewing, you'll be uh, typically using constellations to find those objects. Well, forget all the animals, the pictures of the animals and the people, the flying, uh, <laughs> the flying uh, uh, horses and the fish and the uh, ancient, uh, you know, whales. Forget all of that. Instead, look for simple star patterns. You're not going to see any people or animals in the sky, but you are going to see some star patterns. You'll see some squares. You'll see some triangles. You'll see some bright stars. Um, use that to find the constellations. And lastly, and this is important too, if you want to use a pair of binoculars, I suggest going out on a moonless night, either a new moon or a moon that is uh, not completely lit. Don't go out on a full moon. That's gonna throw a lot of light into the night sky and you'll be disappointed. You won't be able to find those uh, faint, uh, those faint uh, objects that we love looking at through telescopes and binoculars. Well, how do you know when there's gonna be a new moon or, or uh, when the moon is not gonna be lighting up the sky? Go to uh, a website that I listed on the previous slide, Heavens Above, and they provide some really easy to read charts um, plug in your location first. Up at the top here, I selected or entered Mission Viejo. Um, then plug in your date and your time. Remember, this is in 24 hour format. So at nighttime, you're simply going to add, you know, um, the, uh, the clock um, reading to 12. So if you're going to be viewing at 8 o'clock, well, that's 20 hours. And that will show you how much of the moon is going to be illuminated. It's also going to show you where the moon is in the sky. Tonight at 8 o'clock, the moon is approaching Gemini in the sky. So it's in the, uh, it's in the northeast. Um, this is quite a bit of illumination of the moon. So in fact, I'm going out tonight. It's cloudy anyway, so I don't recommend going out tonight for that reason. But if you wait just a few days, maybe wait till the uh, 10th of November at eight o'clock. You can see quite a bit less of the moon is illuminated. That'll make it make the sky a lot darker. Uh, so that's a very handy uh, uh, tip as well. You know, try to pick a, a dark night. So when I go out on the 10th with my binoculars, what kind of objects will I be able to see? Well, now we're gonna have some fun. I'm gonna share with you some of my favorite binocular objects. Um, and the all time favorite of all, just about of all astronomers for using binoculars has to be um, uh, the Pleiades. And I'm gonna share with that with you in just a minute. But generally, you wanna, you wanna pick objects which are large and bright. Um, they'll help you, you know, you'll, they'll find them much easier uh, in the night sky, um, and you won't need a telescope uh, to, to see them. 
So let me show you some of my favorite uh, objects to look at. At the top of the list are the Pleiades, the Seven Sisters, also known in Japan as Subaru. Yes, that car company has, if you look at their logo, they've got uh, six or seven stars on their logo. That's uh, what the Japanese call the Pleiades. It's a beautiful object to look at uh, through uh, a set of binoculars. Well, it, it certainly looks to me like there are a lot more than seven stars there, though. Yeah, there really are. are there. Yeah. So when you look at them, even with a pair of binoculars, you'll see a lot of stars. This picture shows quite a few. Uh, there's even more there. There's over a thousand stars in this particular open cluster. It's in the constellation Taurus. It's really easy to find. And you know what? It's, what's really cool is that it looks like a miniature version of the Big Dipper. There's the uh, there's the Dipper. My drawing isn't all that great. Uh, but it kind of looks like a, a miniature version of the Big Dipper, so it's not hard to find. I bet you most of our guests already know how to find the Pleiades, um, but I'm going to share with you uh, some instructions as well. So this particular cluster is about 440 light years away. So the light that we're looking at when we're looking at the Pleiades actually left those stars 440 years ago. We're looking back in time, remember, when we're, when we're looking at the night sky. Well, how do you find the Pleiades? Well, it's in the constellation Taurus, and the constellation Taurus at this time of the year is in the eastern sky, north, northeast. So if you face north, northeast and look up, you'll be seeing the Taurus constellation. The brightest star there in Taurus is um, Aldebaran. It's kind of a reddish star. So if you look for a reddish star, you'll see kind of a triangle of stars above it. And then if you head your way up from there, there's the Pleiades. Really a beautiful object to look at, really easy uh, to see. Let me share another object with you, Ruth. Uh, another one of uh, my favorites particularly with a pair of binoculars, is uh, what us amateur astronomers call the double cluster. You know, the Pleiades is an open cluster. The double cluster has two. For the price of one, you got two open clusters in the same binocular field of view. So it's really cool to look at. Um, your planetarium software may not list it as the double cluster. So I put on this slide the uh, astronomical designations, NGC 884 and NGC 869. That simply stands for uh, New Galactic Catalog 884. That's one of the catalogs that professional astronomers use to identify objects. If you plug one or both of those numbers into your planetarium software and do a search, it'll show you how to find the double cluster. And it's, it's easily found in uh, tonight's or this week's night sky. It's up right now. I see a lot of uh, blue white stars. If I remember from a previous star party, um, they're young stars. That's right. Um, the, um, the double cluster, the stars in the double cluster are younger than the stars in the Pleiades. The stars in the Pleiades, we estimate at about 100 million years old. Um, and actually, that's not that old for stars. Stars live for billions of years, so uh, that's not that old, 100 million years. These stars are about 12 and a half, 12.8 million years old. They're still babies. Um, and younger stars tend to be bluer and whiter. Uh, these are actually blue-white supergiants um, in the constellation Perseus. Um, it also happens to be the radiant of the Perced meteor shower. So if you go, if you uh, remember in June, I believe it is, when the Perced meteor shower occurs and look up in the sky, this is where the double cluster is approximately where those meteors appear to be coming from. They all appear to be coming from this particular location. Of course, that's totally unrelated to the double cluster. Those meteors are not coming from these stars, believe me. Uh, they're coming from uh, debris that's uh, entering our Earth's atmosphere. But it just happens to be a coincidence 
coincidence that that's where the percent meteor showers radiant is. There's about 300 or a little more than 300 blue white super giant stars in the double cluster. And let me show you how to find it. It's really easy. So, you know, at the last star party, we talked about finding um, several constellations, including the constellation Cassiopeia. It's in the north. So if you, uh, if you face north and look up, you're going to see this big W in the sky. That's the constellation Cassiopeia. And that W is opening down towards the ground. You may remember Cassiopeia is, is that Ethiopian queen who was very vain and got uh, punished by being thrown up into the sky there. And uh, she's in a very, very precarious position at this time of the year. But look, I've circled where the double cluster is. If you go to the end star in Cassiopeia and turn right or head towards the uh, east, you're going to find the double cluster between Cassiopeia and the constellation Perseus. So it's not very far away from uh, Cassiopeia. Let me show, let me share with you three more of my faves, my favorite um, objects to look at, Ruth. Uh, these are three gems which are fun to look at. Um, the ET cluster on the left there, the uh, cluster we refer to as M103. Uh, and if you remember from our uh, star cluster, star party, the M stands for Messier, that French astronomer who cataloged uh, all those objects in the sky that uh, were not comets, which, what, which was what he was looking for. So M103 is one of those objects that that French astronomer in the 1700s cataloged. And then lastly, NGC 663. These are beautiful objects to look at through a pair of binoculars. Well, in M103, I'm seeing all colors of stars. There's some gold, there's reds, there's the blue whites. So they're all different ages. They are. So this is a, uh, um, a combination of young stars and older stars. Those red stars are red giants. Those blue white stars are younger stars there in M103. So there's quite a variety of different ages there. I don't remember off the top of my head how old. Um, M103 is, I may be able to look it up here, but let me show you how easy it is to find it. And one of the wonderful things about these three gems, you can see them in a single field of view with your pair of binoculars. If you got a pair of 10 by 50s, you'll see them all at the same time, which makes for an amazing, amazing view. Um, in fact, looking at the left star chart there, we see the field of view is really around that second star in Cassiopeia. So it's easy to find Cassiopeia. Um, look for the second star, not the, not the bottom star there, but go up one. And that field of view, and I've zoomed in here on it, we can see those three clusters all in that single field of view. M103 is right in the middle. ET which by the way stands for extraterrestrial. Some amateur astronomer thought it looked like ET. I'm not quite sure why. And then NGC 663 all appear in the same field of view. Um, I want you to note something else though. Two other things I wanna point out to you. You see these blue circles? Those are other star clusters and celestial objects that you can also look at while you're there. Cassiopeia is rich with the uh, objects. It's got a lot of celestial objects to look at. Um, I really recommend setting up uh, your tripod for this one and spending at least a half an hour looking at it. There's a lot to gather in with, uh, with Cassiopeia. And your planetarium software will tell you what those other objects are. That's right, yeah. <laughs> Uh, some of them may be good telescopic objects, some may be good uh, 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 binocular objects. You know, Ruth, I want to point out one more thing while we're here on this particular slide, and that is um, our guests may be wondering, well, what is this kind of white cloud in the background here? 
Uh, you probably already know the answer of that. It's the Milky Way. Um, if you were in a really dark sky at this time of night, you would see the Milky Way. And uh, I've zoomed in here on the right. It turns out that Cassiopeia is entirely in the uh, disk of the Milky Way. And that's what we see when we're looking at the Milky Way in the night sky. We're seeing our galaxy's disk. And that makes a lot of sense because open clusters, the type of objects that we've been talking about so far, uh, generally occur in the disk of our Milky Way galaxy. There are other objects outside of the disk that we're going to look at um, and talk about tonight. But uh, these open clusters generally all appear in the disk. I've got some more objects to share with you, Ruth. Please do. So please don't go anywhere, people. <laughs> It, you know, we've talked about the Milky Way. How would you love to see, how much would you like to see another galaxy? Yes. I'd love to. Maybe it's my favorite. You can see, you can actually see another galaxy uh, far, far away uh, with a pair of binoculars. And the galaxy I'm referring to is the Andromeda Galaxy, M31. It's actually a pretty beautiful object to see if you know how to find it. How far away is Andromeda from us? It's pretty far away. It's about two and a half million light years away. And again, that means the light that you're seeing left that galaxy two and a half million light, you know, two and a half million years ago. You imagine what was going on in Earth two and a half million years ago. Um, it's a huge galaxy. It's about a trillion stars in that galaxy. From that distance, though, it appears as kind of a faint, fuzzy cloud. So don't expect to see, with your pair of binoculars, don't expect to see all these dramatic lanes of dust and, and arms stretching out. What you're going to see at best in a dark sky is kind of a faint, fuzzy cloud. Um, but you are seeing a galaxy far, far away. Um, let me show you how easy it is to find it. Go to the next slide here. Okay, well, if we start out in Cassiopeia, where we were just on the previous objects, and move our way to the right, we'll, we'll end up in the constellation Perseus. Um, and Perseus is next to the constellation Andromeda. Above it is the constellation Andromeda. So look for so a line of stars that are kind of um, making a V here, and then go up from the end star there, and that's where you'll find the constellation Andromeda. Um, it's not hard to find. Just find Cassiopeia, Perseus, and then the constellation Andromeda, and head up towards the towards a, you know, a higher position in the sky, almost up to the zenith, um, and you'll find Andromeda. I want to tell you something else about Andromeda, Ruth. Um, I told you that it's uh, pretty far away. It's about uh, two and a half million light years away. Um, it's heading towards us, though. It's making its way to us. If you wait long enough, you won't need a pair of binoculars to see Andromeda. Um, you'll have to wait, though, about four billion years. I don't think I'll be here to see that then. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry to hear that. You're moving somewhere, Ruth? <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going out of town. <laughs> uh, okay, well, maybe next time. Um, but in a f about four billion years, our galaxy, the Milky Way, and the Andromeda galaxy are going to merge. Uh, and Andromeda will fill our night sky with stars. If you think there's a lot of stars that appear um, in the night sky now, just wait four billion years. You'll be amazed at what you see. Um, the two galaxies will be colliding. Now, that sounds a lot worse than it, than it really is going to be. We're not expecting a lot of stars to actually collide with each other. Stars are so far apart, it turns out, even in galaxies like Andromeda, 
that the chances of two stars colliding uh, are pretty slim. Uh, instead, they're just going to get fairly close or closer and gravitationally, you know, affect uh, one another. So uh, if you're not going to wait around four billion years, then you definitely want to have a pair of binoculars or a telescope to find uh, Andromeda. But there is another galaxy that's pretty cool to look at. And let me share that with you right now. It's got a really cool name, too. Oh, let me get rid of all my scratches there. It's called the Triangulum Galaxy because it actually appears in a constellation called Triangulum. And that constellation is real easy to see and find because it's basically a triangle. You know, sometimes astronomers don't get very creative with their names. Mm -hmm. uh, so here's a, an image uh, with a telescope of the Triangulum Galaxy. Now, it's actually pretty hard to find. I've, I don't think I've ever been successful with a pair of binoculars, but if you want to give this a try, I, I, I say go for it. If you're in a really dark sky, you may be able to find Triangulum. Um, it, it's, uh, it's pretty cool. It's another galaxy that you can theoretically see with a pair of binoculars. How many stars are in Triangulum? It's not as massive as the Andromeda galaxy. It's got about 40 billion stars. So it's actually a pretty small it's galaxy um, by comparison. So looking at this, um, it would be better to use a telescope to see it or to see some other objects in the sky too. Yeah. You know, Triangulum is a good example of uh, when you're trying to push a little bit too far with a pair of binoculars. A telescope would probably be better, will definitely be better if it's a large telescope. The larger the telescope, the larger the aperture or width of the uh, lens in the front or the mirror in the back, the more light it can gather. And it makes it a lot easier to faint, see fainter objects like uh, M33 here. And also telescopes can generally magnify a lot more. Triangulum is kind of small. So uh, it, it wouldn't look much larger than a, than a kind of a fuzzy star in a pair of binoculars. But let me show you, if, you're, if you want to give it a try, um, if you're into, into challenges like that, let me show you how to find Triangulum. So here's a star chart. And uh, again, if we start at Cassiopeia, and head east or to the right here, we'll run into Perseus. And then if you go up a little bit towards the you know, zenith in the sky, you're gonna see the constellation Triangulum. And it's below the big constellation of Andromeda. Andromeda Andromeda is huge. It goes on almost forever by comparison. Triangulum is a pretty small constellation. And it's basically three or four stars in the shape of a triangle. And right above that tip star is where you'll find this galaxy that we're talking about. So it's um, not so hard to find. Um, it may be hard to see, um, but if you got a dark sky, go for it. Let me know if you're able to see it with a pair of binoculars. I would love to, to hear you know, what you're able to see. You know, you asked about telescopes and the benefits of telescopes over binoculars. There are another class of objects, which um, I think, and most people think are better with telescopes than with binoculars, but still it's, they're worth looking at with a pair of binoculars. And this class of objects are the planets. And there's actually uh, a few planets up right now, at least three planets that are easily seen, not just with a pair of binoculars, but with your own eyes. If you know where to look, you can see right now Mars, um, the red planet, Saturn, the ringed planet, and Jupiter, which is the king of the planets. And they're perfectly good to look at through a binocular, pair of binoculars, to give you an idea of the difference between what you would see with binoculars versus a telescope. Um, I found these two images to share with you. The one on the left there, that's Jupiter, through a pair of binoculars. Um, I think these were seven by 35, so a little bit smaller than the, my 10 by 50s. Um, look at the image on the right though. 
That's a typical image that you would see through an amateur telescope. Now, in both of those images, you see three or four of Jupiter's moons. Um, so the moons are easily seen with a pair of binoculars, but look at the planet itself. The telescope shows you a lot more detail of the planet. You see the cloud bands, and maybe even the great red spot is visible with uh, you know, a good telescope. Your chances of seeing that with a pair of binoculars are pretty slim. You're not going to see that. If um, you look at Saturn with a pair of binoculars, you may be able to just make out the rings around it through a telescope. You can often see the Cassini division in those rings, and you can and often make out clouds, cloud bands on the planet itself. So here's a good example of where telescopes are much better than binoculars for these classification of objects. But still, taking a look at Jupiter and seeing the moons with a pair of binoculars uh, is, is pretty cool. Uh, and you know what? You know, Galileo discovered those moons and his telescope was, I guarantee, was far worse than the <laughs> pair of binoculars that's been collecting dust in your closet. Well, I've seen some really big binoculars out there. So is that kind of between your pair and the telescope? Would they, they work better? Yeah, sort of. Um, there are some great, huge binoculars that are specially made for astronomy. They can offer you some incredible views. Um, the bigger the binoculars, the, uh, the heavier it is, though. And, um, you know, I used to have a pair of, uh, of uh, 15 by 80s, um, which are like one step up from my 10 by 50s. And believe me, um, my arms got tired holding those. So you really need to have a good tripod, maybe even a tripod that's made for that heavy of a binocular um, to hold it steady. Uh, so uh, tripods, definitely a must with bigger binoculars, uh, particularly 80 millimeter, 100 millimeter or larger. Um, but if you get a chance, if you see somebody out there at night with a big pair of binoculars on a tripod, uh, jump right over there. I mean, the view is going to be amazing. They're, they're actually, it's incredible to use both your eyes uh, when looking at even Jupiter or uh, other objects through a pair of binoculars. It just, they jump out at you. Um, I, I'm going to share with you another object. Uh, well, well, first, let me share with you how to find Jupiter and Saturn tonight or uh, this week or the remainder of this month even. Um, real easy. They're in the uh, south uh, western sky. Um, here's southwest. If you go a little bit further to the west and look up, Jupiter is going to be the brightest thing that you see in the sky. It's not going to be very high above the horizon. So get away from any trees or houses. Uh, if you go out onto the street, uh, make sure you have somebody watching for traffic, please. Um, but easy to find. Jupiter is the brightest thing in the southern sky right now. And a little bit up to the left, you'll find Saturn. It's not nearly as bright as Jupiter is, um, but both are great objects to look at through both binoculars in telescopes. So you don't even have to look for a constellation to find these objects. Later in the year, they'll still be up. Uh, at different times of the night, use your planetarium software. It'll tell you where to look and, and what time would be the best time to, to find those objects. Um, let me share another type of object, which is uh, great with a pair of binoculars, even better through a telescope. Um, and you re may remember our, uh, our previous star party on star clusters. There's two types of star clusters. There's the open cluster and there's the globular cluster. And uh, so far we've been talking about open clusters like the Pleiades. Um, summertime is great for globular clusters or globs as we like to say. Um, and the difference between a globular cluster and an open cluster is uh, as the name implies with globular clusters, the stars are much closer together. They kind of globbed together. And one of my favorite objects right now up in the sky is a globular cluster called M15. 
Uh, through a pair of binoculars, it'll kind of look like a fuzzy, small uh, patch, larger than a star. Uh, through a telescope, you would see uh, a number of stars, maybe 100 or more stars resolved in the, in the uh, telescope. Um, it's, uh, it's really a beautiful object uh, to look at through either a telescope or a pair of binoculars. Uh, through a really big telescope, the way I like to describe it is imagine that you had, and this is hard to imagine, but imagine you had a bag of diamonds and you had some black velvet on your desk and you spilt out those diamonds onto the black velvet through a really large telescope or large pair of binoculars. That's the kind of impact that you would get. It's astounding. That's why I love globular clusters so much. They're beautiful to look at. Um, always, always fun to to find a globular cluster. Let me show you how to find M15. If you found Saturn and Jupiter, um, you're in the right place because it's it's above Saturn and Jupiter. Here's Saturn and Jupiter in the southwest sky right now, head up, straight up, and halfway up to the top of the sky, you'll find M15. That's where that globular cluster is. You won't be disappointed, even with a pair of binoculars. It's a, it's a fun object to look at. And if you remember, when summer runs around again, there's a lot more globular clusters up in June, July, and August. Uh, there's about 50 globular clusters that you can easily see with a pair of binoculars. Um, beautiful objects to watch. There's always interesting objects in the night sky, Ruth. And your planetarium software is a great way of learning where those objects are. Um, but to wrap up, I also want to share something else with you. There's a one of my favorite books is a book published by uh, Sky and Telescope. They publish a, a monthly magazine about astronomy. They have a book called Binocular Highlights, 99 Celestial Sites for Binocular Users. Um, you can pick this up for uh, uh, for uh, your uh, your reader or buy a, um, a soft back um, uh, version of this book on Amazon. Um, it's a great book. It'll show you a lot of objects, where they're located, how to find them, what they look like, tips and, and suggestions if you're out shopping for a pair of binoculars. So this book by Gary uh, Saranek, published by Sky and Telescope, I highly recommend. Well, um, th those are my favorite objects, Ruth, to look at through a pair of binoculars. The ones I listed here are all visible at this time of year. Um, I, I wanna thank our guests for joining us tonight. And thank you, Ruth, for helping me uh, describe how wonderful it is to pair, use a pair of binoculars. I hope that, uh, uh, we all learned something tonight. Well, I certainly did. And we do have a question here from one of our audience members. What Great. about nebulae? Can they be seen through a pair of binoculars? Yes, absolutely. In fact, uh, if you stay up later, um, I don't remember exactly when it rises, but one of the best nebula to look at with a pair of binoculars is the Orion Nebula. So if you can stay up past midnight tonight, or it's cloudy again, not tonight, but another night when it's not cloudy. Look in the east and the Orion constellation will be rising and find the sword in the constellation. And two thirds of the way down the sword is the Orion Nebula. It's a beautiful binocular object. It's a beautiful telescope object. It's the brightest nebula out there. Um, that's a great place to start. And um, your planetarium software will help you find that as well. Very good question. Thank you for that question. Good. Do we have some resources to share with our guests? We do. Um, talking about the planetarium software, on this slide here, I've listed uh, links for uh, free software that you can download for both your computers, both PCs and Macs, and uh, for your smartphones. KSTARS is my favorite, but I've used uh, most of these, Stellarium, Starwalk, Windstars, they're all great packages. Uh, they all have very useful features. It's a great way of learning um, the night sky uh, and planning 
your session, you know, with a pair of binoculars or a telescope. Um, hey, we've got another star party coming up as well, Ruth. We do. And uh, we were talking about this. I have Starwalk on my phone. And um, I, when I was just the way I was sitting, the Andromeda and the Triangulum uh, galaxies were coming up on Starwalk. So this I always have with me so I can always just hold it up and figure out what I'm looking at. And yeah. I highly recommend it. It's easy to use. If so if there are no other questions, I want to thank you all for spending your hour with us tonight. And don't forget to register for our next star party coming up on December 11th. And Richard tells me he's going to be doing this from the comfort of his lounge chair. So we're going to learn astronomy and how to learn more about astronomy from the comfort of our living rooms. My favorite uh, way of doing it. Yeah. <laughs> and while you're on the website, you can register for other upcoming star parties as well as look at other programs that we have to help support our students in school right now. And maybe like me, you're going to become a volunteer of uh, Science Heads. So we look forward to that. Uh, everyone enjoy your weekend and certainly be safe out there. Thank you again for joining us tonight. Thank you. Good night. Good night, everyone.